racism is quite real. And the, the, this episode really deals with that. It really addresses that although race, um, racism is quite real. And the, the, this episode really deals with that. It really addresses that although race is an illusion, although race does not exist, racism is that race. So um, this really deals more with systems, how systems have been created to provide certain groups within society with more um, opportunities than other groups. Um, at the end of the documentary, we'll have a um, short discussion about the film. So, um, and um, so this is um, my dear colleague Stephanie Clark and I have been working um, together for a long time now in addressing issues of health inequities. And we know that um, you know health is just more than simply being sick. And the house we live in, the policies, the systems that are set up in our contemporary U U.S. society do have an impact on the overall health of all the members of the community, all the members of the community. However, we have seen that some benefit less than other groups. So that's some of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, health is in crisis. Education is in crisis. The economic situation right now is in crisis. We're in crisis. That's the reality. And it's affecting the health of the nation, it's affecting the health of the state, and it's certainly affecting the health of London. So, but again, I'm going to go back. There's some groups that are benefiting less than others. And it's simply dividing um, race and the racial lines. So, Stephanie and I are going to be um, kind of facilitating the process. We're not going to say much because, you know, I'm sure all of you have a lot to say. And what we're going to do is, um, if you could say your name quickly and tell us your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions around the what um, we just saw today. Who would like to At the reaching the age of 60, not too long ago, that this um, things that you grew up with and things are still going on. I, one time I gave a, a just shared with someone from Ebony Magazine. I can't believe that my children still have to go through something that I had to go through when I grew up in segregated Louisiana, migrated to California and still now been in Connecticut since 1969. That this is still, I'm fighting for my grandchildren now to have that equality without seeing the color and just letting them, teaching them what they need to be taught. And so that's my battle, it's a battle, it's a, a raging battle sometimes, and sometimes I can get it in control and can, can check it, and sometimes I can't. And I'm just being openly and honest with you about it because I figure like this, any impartiality is injustice. Mm -hmm. Any. What's good for mine should be good for yours. And then we should work for the overall betterment of a community, our nation, our world, our country. And there are places that can do this, that do this. So why can't we do one? And uh, I found uh, this uh, film to be quite thought provoking. And uh, quite frankly, I think we tend to look at life through our own eyes. And I can't really apologize for my opinion. Mm -hmm. This is where I was born, or where I live. And I'm not going to. However, it helps to see how other people see things, to learn. And as a community leader, in order to be able to wrap your arms around the entire community, you've got to have a better understanding of the people you represent. 
And I think that an environment such as this does just that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity just to be here. What this film did for me today was it, it, it further solidified the fact that all of this stuff is systematically ingrained by society. Um, as long as I can remember when, when you're growing up, when you observe children playing in a playground, you see a kaleidoscope of colors. You know, racism, disparity, discrimination, all those things are taught. That's not something that a person is born with. It's just like this whole idea of race. It's something that has been constructed. And the, the film today further solidified the fact that all of these things are systematically ingrained over periods of time. And not only are they ingrained, but they, this thing that we talk about about being colorblind, even though some systems may be colorblind to certain things, there's still that undertow of division and disparity among the disparaged even. Even in certain communities, there's disparity among the disparaged communities. You know, we still have, we still live by classes. We still live by economic status. We still live by, even if we don't notice or observe or want to identify people by their skin, their title. We have all of these things. That I am just a person. I'm a physical person living a spiritual experience. And I do my best to try exude, to exude that in all walks of life. Um, and then we have these challenges that society presents. It was um, one of the sociologists, I believe, made this statement that think about the message um, that continues to get passed on. I mean, it's not necessarily something taught because I don't think, you know, for the most part, most parents are not teaching their children to be racist. But in a society where you're observing your children or our children, the points you make, if I have a white family and I've been sent to the good schools and I live in a good neighborhood and I and but I see my friend who is not white, who hasn't had those same opportunities, psychologically, what is the impact that that's having? in the communities, uh, in the perception even that our children have of their own. That's exactly what yeah, it is. Yeah, still a sibling Absolutely. So that, the harm that that continues to cause. And then, just the, uh, the statement, colorblind society, I have a problem. I have a problem. With Thank you. And if you, if you want to go ahead, yes. touch I do problem. have a problem with that. I don't see well, first of all, my name is Laura Lillian Davidson. I live in Norwich. I'm here representing the Greenville family zone in Norwich. It's a uh, disenfranchised community in Norwich. I am the district administration for this as well. But um, as far as that, this concept of being colorblind, I take offense to that 100%. Why do we have to be colorblind? You know, how can you ignore the color of our skin? You know, when God created the flowers, he didn't make them one color. He made them different colors. And just to say, oh, I'm colorblind, that exempts you from being racist or exempts you from being privileged. You know, you might be Caucasian, and you can't help it if you were given this entitlement of power, privilege, and access. Let's be real and let's deal with the real thing. Racism, race does matter in everything that we do. It's a social construct that began in the 1600s in this country, and we need to deal with that. Anybody else? I saw a hand back there. And then. Oh, just that. It was even presented to the children in a song. The message for me remembering watching something like that was, oh my goodness, I go to Waterford. <coughs> These kids, it is, we're all the same. They're going to look at me the same. I never really realized the words black did not come into that. They were talking to their own children. There was no one like me in that circle. So if I have that as a parent, 
and I pass that on to my daughter, she gets the message. So what does she do to her children? She shows them her childhood movies, and her children get the message, and so on and so forth, and then they share it with a friend. But I can't share that because it has no connection to me. It didn't apply to me. I knew that then. I could feel it. It never applied. So yes, the subliminal undertones and the message is still being passed through, whether it be in song, whether it be in the lifestyle, whether it be in conversation, the vacations that are taken, everything. It's, it's just unbelievable to be on this side at 32 and feel this way, hoping that going to Waterford, I made these friendships with friends so that they could see it's not about my color. It's about who I am. Learn to get to know me. And then to have to do that within my own community is hard enough to help us to say, listen, we're family. We can work together. Get to know me. And then we can turn together and face what's out in the world. All this other stuff is not known really, because it's not taught. And um, I find to see it on the screen now and, and to have to you know, sit amongst my peers and my friends and neighbors and everything. My heart is broken about it, really. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the place I want to remain. Mm -hmm. I want to be in place, a place of advocacy and, and action. Um, I look at the, that it's built into the system, it's built into America, and it's a part of America. And, and as, as far as being colorblind is concerned, why would you need to be? For you to say that you're colorblind, talking to me tells me that you don't want to see my color. It's part of who I am. It's part of that flavor we're talking about. <laughs> anyway. <laughs>
So some of that still exists. So I want to take that yes. hand in the back and then you go ahead. Hi, my name is Judy Katz. Um, I work in the city of New London, actually in housing. Um, so this was really interesting to me. But um, I take some, ex I, I truly, again, keep that word colorblind because I love the art of yes. all the different colors and shades and my daughter who has a beautiful complexion and I would die with that complexion so I don't want to be colorblind. I do take some exception to the entitlement of being Caucasian because yes, I hate racism and yes, it is still alive today and, and how it is still existing is so frustrating but I still again, and I might have said this a couple weeks ago, was I believe that besides racism, there's classism. Because I grew up in the projects, as a white girl in the projects, didn't have any of the, you know, opportunities that she probably did, you know, and because I was white and, and poor, getting into colleges, you know, was the same because of my social economic status besides my race. Yes, it may seem like because of being Caucasian, there were, my life was easier, but it really wasn't. Um, compared to hers who grew up in Waterford and was probably, like she said, you know, so isolated by herself but had much more opportunity. I was isolated in the opposite end of it. I was in the projects as probably one of the few Caucasians. So besides racism, we need to really keep the, I, the awareness that especially in New London, there's still such a classism mm -hmm. that is much more prevalent than just racism. Thank you for your statement. Well, I want to talk about issues, and this is a huge conversation, so we can't do, I mean, I do an entire presentation, right, uh, Stephanie? Uh, I mean, uh, again, we've done a, a lot of privilege. And that's what it is. You're absolutely right. There is issues of poverty in every group. Okay, in every group, because even among the Latino community, you have your social yeah. strata. Yeah. There right. is absolutely in the African American community, absolutely in the Asian, Asian, whatever community you take. That's the reality. But if you go to a restaurant, for example, and a white doctor arrives and a black doctor arrives at the same time, yes. and this experiment has been done over and over nationwide and even internationally, they will take the white person first. In healthcare, this experiment has been done. In fact, there was a report on equal treatment put out by the Institute of Medicine, where they did research, extensive research nationwide, and they adjusted for all social determinants of health, education, geographic, political, marital status, you know, age, whether you had insurance, no insurance, whether you had higher education, or all of that. They found that the constant, the constant issue that was the cause for disparities was the color of the skin. And it added to that if you didn't speak English. And further added to the disparities in healthcare if you didn't speak English. So, and even at Southern New Hampshire University School of Community Economic Development did a whole study around Americans, which they found that if you start, which is what they said, without even trying anything, but it's because the, the, the issue of, and this is the law, that's why the two previous episodes build onto that how that has been created, so institutionalized into the fabric of our society that we don't realize it. We don't even, if you ask why people do they think of their race, we don't get to. the great majority will tell you, no, we don't have to. When you ask particularly black women, many will tell you every day because of their day-to-day -day experiences. If they go to the market, if you go to the mall, if they go to the store, they're already checking, making sure you're not stealing or something like that.